So we've got something special for you today, the Ryzen 5 5600X. This is not a launch day video, this is after we've had a little chance to uh, play with these. There's some cool stuff that's available that wasn't available at launch day. Things like smart access memory that we can use with our 6800 and our 6800 XT. Some BIOS revisions, updates from boards, even B450 support. So B450 chipset motherboard support. It's out a little early because, you know, AMD said January, but a lot of uh, vendors are offering at least beta level BIOSes with beta level hiccups and gotchas with their B450 motherboards. But this, this is a six core CPU. You know, AMD is kind of famous for pushing the envelope for more cores, but I think there's a big misunderstanding of exactly what that means. And we're going to talk about it. So first off, this is a mind-blowing 5600X CPU, uh, six-core CPU. It's a mind-blowing six-core CPU. And the reason that I say that, and the reason that I don't think that AMD is getting enough credit here for what they've done, is when Ryzen first launched, cores was the name of the game. It's the more cores meme. AMD's like, we're just gonna keep adding cores because, you know, that's we're just jokers. That's what we can do. We've got we got the real estate to do that. We've got the uh, the processes to do that. Let's just keep adding cores. And so at the time, the six core, you know, the first gen rise in the six core, the conversation was around. You know, we've got the four core six thousand series and seven thousand series CPUs from Intel, the seventy seven hundred K, and you know that's four cores. But Andy's giving us six cores, and those six cores are not as fast. Each each individual core is not as fast. But you get six of them, so you can grow into that with the future and so on and so forth. Fast forward to third gen Ryzen, the Ryzen 3600 is still one of the best deals for gamers that there has ever been. It's six cores, it's not, you know, it's considerably faster per core than those first gen Ryzen CPUs. Uh, it is basically at parity with the lower end Intel offerings. I mean, yeah, Intel had the crown at the high end, but the high end costs a lot. And for AMD, the single thread performance, there wasn't really a huge difference between the 3600 and the 3600X, and even moving on up into the 3900X if you were willing to put in a little time and a little tuning, especially around memory tuning. Well, here we are now, and the 5600X is six cores again. And I think that the part that's lost here is that people are hyper fixated on six cores. Intel has the, the 10600K, uh, which is six cores and easily overclockable to five gigahertz. Uh, certainly that's been the case on half a dozen machines that I've helped forum members put together and friends and friends of friends and other stuff like that. And the machines that have passed through my hands, in other words. Uh, memory tuning, you get a lot out of memory tuning, and especially like the cache ratio tuning and the ring frequency on that six core. They're pretty overclockable, the 10600. Uh, K type CPUs from Intel. It, it, it's, a, it's a pretty solid offering. Well, the 5600X completely changes all of that because each core in the 5600X is substantially faster than the cores that are offered by Intel. So much so that, you know, this 5600X in a lot of cases is on parity with the 9900K. So it got me thinking, it's like, okay, all things being equal, let's take a look at three different systems. An Intel 8700K overclocked to five gigahertz because you could reasonably get 4.9 to five gigahertz on an 8700K of the day. So this is our first system. It's an ASRock system with a 10 gigabit ethernet NIC. It's got 32 gigs of memory. It's four sticks of memory. So it's dual channel, dual rank. Our Ryzen comparison system also has dual channel, dual rank memory, but also 32 gigabytes, but on two physical sticks of memory because it's easier to achieve clock stability uh, and overclocking stability on that. Now the 5600X at stock performance is substantial. The maximum boost clock at stock is about 4.6 gigahertz with a base clock of 3.7 gigahertz. It's also 65 watts. In the box, you get this competent, but not great, cooler so you don't have to buy a cooler if you're if you're building a system really on the cheap you can use this just don't plan on any overclocking or anything like that because it it's you're not it's not going to be great for overclocking most games still don't really use more than than four cores although a few do there's a few notable exceptions and so your game performance on a 5600x is going to be about the same 
as a 5800X, as about the same as a 5900X, is eh, roughly the same as a 5950X. The real difference there is the clock speed. Now it turns out the 5600X is actually overclockable. It's quite overclockable because that whole 65 watt power limit, if you're willing to throw that out the window and get a reasonable cooler and also throw your warranty out the window, you can get quite a bit more performance on this. I think a lot of the, a lot of the issue, if anyone takes issue with the 5600X is down to its $300 price tag. It's like $300 for a six core, but you can get the 3600 for $200. Is there really that much of a difference in performance? So, we're gonna use ridiculously expensive GPUs. I don't think these are particularly good pairings, the 3090 or the 6800 XT with a 5600 XT, but this is meant to represent the, you know, theoretical uh, worst case scenario. So assuming that it's a year or two or three from now, and you can buy 2080 level TI, 2080 Ti level performance for like $500. A lot of the overclocking that's been done so far with the 5600X has just been a straight all core overclock. People have been pushing this thing to you know 1.4 volts, which is I think a little bit much uh, when you're talking about an all core overclock and getting 4.8 gigahertz. Well, AMD's released a new thing called the AMD Curve Optimizer, and that actually is the thing to use with this. Now it's going to void your warranty if you do that. So you're, you're, you're putting $300 on the line, but you can push this 4.6 gigahertz to 4.7, 4.8 gigahertz. The particular CPU that I have here, if you do 4.75 gigahertz, pretty stable without me having to push the voltage all that much. I did have to push the voltage a little bit, but it's putting it into the territory of um, what the chiplet is handling as if it were say in like a 3900X. So we're talking about, you know, a two chiplet CPU. Um, and this is just by tweaking the package power and some other parameters and also using the, the curve optimizer, which sort of pushes things a little bit as far as the fit algorithm is concerned. If you dial those things in, the multi-core performance improves a bit, but the single thread performance will also improve. Up till now, overclocking on Ryzen meant that you sacrificed those single core boosts because a lot of the time the power requirements were just too high to achieve those maximum boost clocks across all of your cores. Of course, with six cores, you know, that's a little easier. Sometimes you get a golden chip and you can do 4.7 or 4.8 gigahertz all core, but at a kind of uh, high wattage for what the silicon is. With the curve optimizer, it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit more like a scalpel for tuning these things as opposed to the blunt instrument of an all-core overclock or messing with the system on chip voltage and then doing an all-core overclock and that kind of thing. The first thing you should do though is tune your memory. Tuning your memory doesn't void your warranty and gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, even if you've got cheaper, slower memory, it's worth going through the, the motions to do memory tuning if you wanna squeeze a little bit more performance out of your silicon. Get that running, get the Infinity Fabric running it a little higher. You know, from 3200 to 3600, it really doesn't matter as much as the overall latency, which are those primary latency numbers, but also your secondary timings as well. Your secondary timings can be just as important as the primary timings on the memory for memory tuning. For me though, 4.75 gigahertz on two cores meant that the single thread performance of my 5600X with a better cooler than this using the Fractal Celsius, you know, 240 millimeter cooler was on par with the 5800X, even though this is only a 5600X. So the 5600X only got even more 5600XE. Now I, you know, it's still a six core CPU at the end of the day, but that meant that the six cores is basically running for gaming workloads at parity with a 9900K. I'm gonna have to revisit that and do some more testing, but if you'd like to see some more information about that or you do a similar build and you've noticed that kind of thing with your gaming, or even more importantly, if you've noticed any anomalies, you know, the, uh, the Escape from Tarkov anomalies are dramatically reduced on the 5000 series Ryzen than the 3000 series Ryzen, especially the dual chiplet 3000 series Ryzen. It's a little bit like Far Cry. Um, then that's, that's maybe another topic for another day. So taking a quick look at the gaming benchmarks here, you can see a fair bit of difference, especially around the 1080p resolution, but it's a little misleading. Like I will concede that this is a little misleading because these are really super high end GPUs. Most of the time you would not play these games at ridiculous frame rates. So with Tomb Raider, we're talking about a range of 160 to 65 FPS to 180 ish FPS. That's the range and nobody really should be playing these games at those kinds of frame rates. I think about 90 FPS is the sweet spot for this particular game. 
When we're talking about other games like uh, eSports titles, those are already optimized to run at hundreds of FPS. So I don't know that those really matter. You could run those on a potato and it doesn't really make a lot of difference. Some of the other games that we took a look at, the performance really sort of follows suit. It really sort of follows what you would expect there. On our Intel comparison system, our 10600K, you know, moving from its its max boost clock of 4.7 gigahertz to that five gigahertz overclock, yeah, we could claw back some of the performance difference here and get another four or five FPS. But generally, the Ryzen 5 5600X system was doing better. If you add in smart access memory and the other features, then it only widens the gap if you're also using the AMD uh, GPUs. At least NVIDIA has not enabled smart access memory yet, although they're working on it and they're pretty close. If you had an older system, like this Intel 8700K, uh, you can get those CPUs right now for around $200, give or take. They're a six core CPU. Out of the box, the specs aren't really super impressive, but you can overclock them to like 4.9, 5 gigahertz, as long as you've got reasonable cooling. So our six core 8700K overclocked to five gigahertz all core with 32 gig gigabytes of memory. The memory is as like for like as it possibly can be without it, you know, because it's cross platform, it can't exactly be like for like. And plus also the different configurations here is a little, a little challenging. I don't think that anybody is gonna have an 8700K system from a couple of years ago with 3600 CL14 memory. I just don't think that's that's gonna be a thing. But memory access patterns on Intel don't really matter that much. So I can see that the memory difference here is contributing somewhat to the comparison to the older system. But if you're buying an older system used, it's not going to come with new memory. Maybe if you got parts and you mix and match it, but that's a dimensional crazy that I don't even wanna get into because it's kind of beside the point of what I'm trying to show you here rendering or blender or something like that. Those things really favor having more cores, but again, the 5600X can really stretch its legs here. Six cores is you know, good enough for like one and a half cores and a little bit more, so it's pretty crazy. Other Intel CPUs that I didn't test here also are kind of at a disadvantage because you know the older Intel i5s, most of them don't even have hyper-threading and the 5600X here does have hyper-threading, so that makes quite a difference in performance as well, depending on what you're doing. One other thing that I'll mention about the 5600X is because of its 65 watt TDP, it makes it particularly well suited for ultra small form factor builds. We've got systems like our, our Dan Case A4 with our super teeny Noctua <laughs> L9A uh, CPU cooler. And this CPU actually works reasonably okay-ish mostly with that CPU cooler. Now, keep in mind that this is different. I mean, 65 watts is not 65 watts because the part that gets hot is super teeny. That's the boiler snake. The boiler snake wants me to tell you about the Acetec all-in-one because this is a this is a great cooler for that CPU because uh, you get a little bit of thermal capacitance here. I mean, if you're running the 5600X, you know, flat plank, full tilt, and it heats all the fluid in this thing and it can't dissipate the heat, then it doesn't really do you know, quite as well as a, as a decent tower cooler. But if you're in a case like the Dan Case A4 where you, you, you've got a limited amount of uh, physical real estate or you need to move the radiator somewhere that it can get some, some fresh air, this works really well. But this also suggests that you've got a higher budget to work with than if you're working with the 5600X and its stock cooler. So overall, the verdict on the 5600X is $300 but it really is $300 of processor. I hope that AMD is able to create another, uh, you know, no questions asked, winner hands down budget option, like the $200 3600X. If you only have a $200 CPU budget, the 3600X is probably still my pick for now until at least lower cost 5000 series CPUs come out. But for $300, this CPU, it's pretty darn good. I've also noticed that Intel has put CPUs on sale, like they've had the 9900K on sale for around $300. That's also a pretty good deal. So there you go, the 5600X. I was fully expecting when I started this to find that like the 8700K at five gigahertz at $200 was just as good as the 5600X for gaming. But that's not actually the case. And matches or beats the five gigahertz performance of the 10600K from Intel, the, the current generation CPU from Intel. That may change when 11th generation CPUs come down the pike. So restated another way in terms of value, the 5600X, it's a $300 processor, 
but you know there are other eight core processors in the market that are also three hundred dollars it really is a three hundred dollar processor the am4 platform gives you a pretty good upgrade path you can all, even if there's not another six thousand series cpu for am4 you could always go to you know 12 or 16 cores at some point in the future when those cpus become more available second hand or something like that but uh, yeah, six cores, the six cores is like an eight core. It's kind of the opposite situation as when AMD debuted, that's sort of what I started with in this video. AMD started with more cores, but the cores are slower. But at $300, there's, there's six cores, but the cores are faster than other six core competitors. So it's, you know, it, we were on this side of, of, of noon when Ryzen debuted, and now we're on this side of noon in the fifth generation of Ryzen. So it's, it's a really interesting situation. I'm Wendell, this is level one. If you build a system based on this, love to see your pictures in the forum. Go to the forum, comment, post pictures, hang out. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.